Hi, it's Neil Shawnee Hill on your entertainment news. I'm with a man that really doesn't need any introduction, of course. He's the golden voice of radio, and that's the title of his brand new exclusive book. Remember, though, David? Yes, remember, Neil. If you miss it, you miss out. Don't miss David today on your entertainment news. Radio One. Two seven five and two eight five. Solid gold. Radio One. Across the nation. Two seven five and two eight five. Radio One. David, lovely to finally meet you at last. I'm not just saying this, I've finished your book. What a great read. It's like you're chatting to me personally. You've written it all yourself. When you were writing it, was that hard? You know, did the memories come back quite easy or did you think, oh, hang on a minute, what, what happened there? You know? I think I have got quite a good memory, but I think what ha helped as well was the fact that I was a writer. You know, I started yeah. out as a scriptwriter on television and I'd written quite a lot of articles and I had written a couple of books before, one of which I think you, you actually <laughs> bought. Uh, that was Be David Hamilton's Beauty. Beauty tips for women. Which was fabulous. Can I just, because just to give the premise of that, people sent you tips. There were genuine tips yes. from your listeners. Yeah. And there were millions sending you stuff in. And I just, I don't know how I got this book. It was presented to me, but it was, it had all these like very cheap tips in, which today would, I think it should be republished personally. Well, there were some wonderful all... tips. There were things like, um, you know, if you put tea bags on yeah. your eyes, it gets rid of the lines. Yeah. Or if you put yogurt on your face, that's supposed to be all these yeah. bizarre things that people were doing. But they were actually genuinely sending you them in, weren't they, and saying, yeah. I do this, David, and then you'd have to read it out. So, yeah, so what we did was we put it into a, a book and we sold it back to the people who'd given us, <laughs> given us for nothing in the first place. You actually, know. that's not a bad idea, is it? You, ah, know, you yeah. get the contact in and then you go... Oh, yeah. Well, Terry Wogan did that as well, of course. He sold back a lot of material that listeners yeah. had very kindly given him and he used it on his radio show because yeah. he was very clever the way that he used, you know, audience participation and then sold it back to them afterwards. Well, I love in your book when you mention uh, the late, great Sir Terry because obviously I didn't know, I've met him a few times but I didn't know him like yourself. But I love the, the line in it, David, where you say he was sort of making out that he wasn't ambitious and he wasn't that. Yes. Right? But he was, in fact, a very clever businessman. He had, as you say, a, a, a fleet of cars that picked people up. He had other businesses. Yeah. I mean, did he come... The, the public that we knew, uh, the, the Terry that we knew, was he slightly more ambitious when you knew him as you did one to one well uh, in in my book i've i've got a chapter on each of the 11 yeah. presenters i call them the first 11 and terry yeah. is is one and i think the terry uh, chapter is a very affectionate one um, terry was one of those people one of those broadcasters who was the same off as he yeah. was on you know he was a lovely guy i remember once he once he asked me to play in a cricket match at, at Taplow, which is his local oh, yeah. village of charity match. And I said to him, Terry, I haven't played cricket for 20 years. He said to me, if Isla Sinclair can play, you can play. <laughs> and there was no answer to that. So I played along with Pete Murray and Roy Castle and Ernie Wise, and we had a wonderful day. I think the thing about Terry was that, you know, he had this lovely laid back style and he tried to kid us that he was lazy. But of course, as you said, I mean, yeah. he was a very driven man. He, he must have died a multimillionaire. He was a very, very successful man um, and a very shrewd man, very clever businessman. But, but with this lovely Irish charm, yeah. of course, um, but uh, uh, as you said as well, you know, he at one time had the taxi firm that yeah. took people to and from I the I didn't BBC. know that. I thought it yeah. was very clever. You uh, he also had an agency which handled people like Tony Blackburn and uh, yeah. Gloria Hunniford and Kenny Everett. Um, and of course, that meant that um, he, he was not only working yeah. as an artist, but getting commission from other artists as well and didn't have to pay an agent because he was his own agent. Yeah, which I mean, it, but when you think about it, I don't think that'd be allowed to date the old cross promotion, wouldn't oh, it? It'd be I, very difficult I to I think the that. BBC now have to be so careful about yeah. it, everything that nothing like that would happen uh, today. <laughs> Fun. <laughs> We've actually got a new thing that's happened recently with the BBC where everybody has become PAYE. Yeah. And I think probably because some people were having money paid into funds that went abroad or whatever. Yeah. So my little shows that I, I do now on BBC local radio, um, I get 20% deducted at source, you know, which is 
Very upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> now, Ken Dodd wouldn't like it, would he? <laughs> we'll get to Ken shortly, actually. But I want, a couple of stories that I want to just throw at you. Um, you were, and now, one of your big sort of breaks was working for ATV. Now, ATV is a huge, huge company at this time. You're a very young lad. Um, you know, what was it like in ATV at that time? Because it was Lou Grade, Moguls, all that yes. sort of stuff. Were you nervous? It dude? was Lou Grade and, uh, and Val Parnell. Yeah. The first job I had was uh, straight from school, was a messenger boy. So I collected and delivered mail to and from the, uh, the, the good and the great. So there's people like uh, Lou Grade, who of course became Lord Grade, and Val Parnell, the man behind Sunday Night at the London yeah. Palladium. And um, yes, I mean, it was quite, uh, I was quite... Were they hurt. nice people, though? Was, was well, didn't, nice? They didn't have a lot to say to me. I was yeah. just a little <laughs> messenger boy. The person I did get talking to was the man, a man called Harold Jameson, who was the head of the script department. And he said to me one day, he said, you seem like a bright boy. He said, uh, what, what would you like to do? So I said, well, I'm a writer. He said, what have you written? So I said, well, for a couple of years now, I wrote a column in a magazine called Soccer Star. As it happens, that week I had an article published in TV Times. And one of his department was leaving, Tessa Diamond, who was the woman who created Emergency Ward 10, which I think is probably the first television soap. That was massive. Massive. Just huge. She was leaving and he needed a new writer and um, I took her place. And the first thing I did was I wrote the uh, announcer scripts, so the continuity announcer scripts. Um, and uh, it was all based on promoting the programs, so yeah. trying to find you know, nice ways of getting people to watch. Um, and that was the first job. And then uh, Jameson said to me one day, he was doing a, a Sunday night series called Portrait of a Star. Oh, I heard uh, of that. And yeah, uh, yeah. he said, he went out, I think, after the Jack Jackson show on Sunday night. And he said to me, I'm going to be away on holiday and I want you to do two editions of Portrait of a Star to write them. So the stars that I wrote about was one was Marlon Brando and the other one was Henry Fonda. And I had to go to a, a film studio and see their films. I had to pick two minute clips that would be a self-contained scene that would give you a good example of their role in that film. And then I had to write, the, and I didn't know much about them at all. I mean, all. you're doing everything, editing, producing, <laughs> you know, right? I think I was 18. Yeah. And so my I, my family were living in Fulham in a in a, in a flat in Fulham that had hot and cold running mice. <laughs> and uh, I remember the, the bath was in the kitchen, so to have a bath you had to take the tabletop off. And so it was, you know, fairly humble. And we sat there on Sunday night watching Portrait of a Star and my name came up, script by. And my mother looked at me, you know. And she said, Proud. That's my boy. <laughs> Two tears, maybe. <laughs> that is lovely. And as you say, to get that break so young, I mean, you, you know, we, we were speaking in the green room a while ago. I don't know if you get those sort of breaks now, you know, if you're in that sort of environment, because I don't you've know. shown some aptitude and you, you then this guy sees this and thinks, oh, great. Well, it was a, it was a very lucky break. And I was, I was really enjoying my job as a scriptwriter. And one day a buff envelope arrived on the mat and it was my call up for national service <laughs> in the RAF. And I thought, God, I've got no interest in guns and marching yeah. and war. I hate it all, yeah. but you had to do it. Uh, but again, I was lucky. I got posted to Germany yeah. and I did my first radio broadcast. I went to see the head of the uh, British Forces Network in Cologne. And I said, look, I'm a scriptwriter. Can you use me here? Because, you know, I'm really bored doing all this marching <laughs> stuff. So he said to me, well, we don't actually have writers, but we do need someone to read the football results. So I thought, well, I was always a big football fan. So that was the first thing I did. And then one day I said to him, I said, you should have some rock and roll. I don't think he knew what rock and roll was. And I said, all this music that you're playing, Bing Crosby and Peggy Lee, I said, it's fine for the officers, but the troops want rock and roll. He said, how do you know? I said, because I am a troop. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, and you're the age, aren't you? That I, I was yeah. 19. Yeah. And uh, Elvis Presley was in Germany at the same time doing his national service with the US Army. Yeah. And I think, I think he was in Frankfurt and I was in Cologne. I didn't actually meet him, but I did play his records. And of course, the troops loved it because it was Elvis Presley, yeah. Jerry Lee Lewis, Little Richard. All the greats. Fats Domino, yeah. all the greats. And the first international star I met Neil, I've got to tell you, was Connie Francis. Loved her, who's sorry I now. was I was oh. 19, yeah. and she came out to promote her record, Lipstick on Your Collar. <laughs> and she was small, she was 
dark, smouldering. She was very sexy, you know. <laughs> and you're young. And I was, well, I was 19. Yeah. And, and there were a dozen of us who met her, and she remembered everybody's name. Isn't that incredible? Now, that's a and, star, though, isn't and it? And she looked at me, and I was holding my glass, which, by the way, was lemonade, like this. And she looked at me, and she said, what do you think, David? And I went, my hand went like this. went, Connie Francis. Being international stars call me David. <laughs> I was a little sprog in the and in the RF. Couldn't believe it. So, yeah. did I play her record? I certainly did. And you probably play them now, don't you? Still, yes, you love it, I still play yeah. it now. Yeah. And of course, it got onto family favourites, which yeah. is the you know the the Cologne end of mm. the big radio show of the week. Mm. And so she got lots of plays for lipstick on your collar. And I always remember that. Yeah. Oh, Connie, you see, it's lovely again, isn't it? Because you're talking about a time when uh, stars were stars and, and when they arrived, you felt their presence almost, didn't you? It was Certain people have that, you know, when they come into a studio and you think, yes, you know you've got to kind of up your game. I mean, when, when, I, when I look your, read your book, you have had a fascinating life, though, because you've done, I think, I would say the reason to your success is you've uh, been diverse and you've done so many different things. You, you know, you've been an announcer, on-screen announcer. Yeah. I mean, that again was a big job, you know, for Thames TV and stuff it like that. It was when announcers you know. appeared in vision yeah. between, between programs. And I tried to inject a little bit of humor into yeah. it. And I remember once um, really upsetting Noel Gordon uh, oh, because <laughs> we would, the continuity writers, you know, doing what I had done yeah. before. Now I've got somebody writing scripts for me, which yeah. is great. And the continuity writer wrote, Tonight, an actor arrives at the Crossroads Motel. So I read, I delivered this line to camera, and then looking at the clock, which is just next to the camera, I realized I'd still got two seconds left, so something to fill in with. So it came out like this. Tonight, an actor arrives at the Crossroads Motel, not before time. So the phone rings in the studio, and it's Noel Gordon. <laughs> not, not an assistant, but the actual person. David, I'm very upset with you. Why is that, Noel? What you just said about my programme. I said, well, I'm sorry. I said, but it's what everybody says about your programme. So she said, well, and she, she was not, she was not happy. But luckily, that was an ATV programme, and I was now working for Thames. So <laughs> <laughs> because she it was would have okay. the power to fire you, though, wouldn't she? She was so big. She was very, you very, know, and, yeah. and very friendly with Val Parnell, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. So, mean, yeah. Gosh. So, you see, now, the thing, the, the bit that I like in the book, of course, is, well, and we'll, you've mentioned that you've got all the top people that, you know, were in that golden era, as you call it, of Radio yeah. 1. Um, when you got to the BBC, and you, because I love this part of the book, when you get there, you can't quite believe it. You know, you've kind of got in there, because it's the dream, isn't it? Yeah. Like, and it's the golden ticket for anybody who's in radio at that time. Yeah. You want to be on there. So what was it like when you first walked through Broadcasting House? Were you well, floating a bit? <laughs> I, I was part of what I call the radio generation, because in my I lived on a very remote farm in Sussex, yeah. and the radio was the, the window to my world, yeah. this little magic box in the corner of the room, because I was an only child. Uh, the only person I had to play with was my sheepdog, Scamp. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I heard these crowds at football matches yeah. like, you know, St. James's Park or White Hart Lane. What would it be like to be in a... And then I heard all the great variety shows that were on the light program, things like Itmar and yeah. Take It From Here and stuff like that. So funny, though, aren't they? But I, th these radio people were my, uh, and I used to, I used to impersonate them. And at Christmas time, I would entertain my family with, uh, you know, uh, I won't take my coat off. I'm not stopping. You know, <laughs> all these comedians had their, their, yeah, their, their catchphrases. Catch yeah, 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 yeah. Can I do you now, sir? Yeah. You know, I, I used to do all that. Um, and so now, suddenly, in the '60s, I'm doing my first broadcast in Broadcasting House, which is, as you know, a very yeah. impressive building. And I walk in through those portals and I can I can hear the voices of, of all the uh, the ghosts of all the great broadcasters that I've heard down the years mm. and I thought suddenly I'm here yeah. you know I'm going to be one of those people are going to be listening to me and you know I still can't understand how my voice goes into that microphone <laughs> and comes out of somebody's Isn't that radio <laughs> yeah of all these years I've been yeah. doing it how does it work I don't yeah. know and, and as you say, though, you know, you get in there and it's, a, I mean, a big success for you. You, know, you climbed your way in uh, and then you got more success. And you were the, the, the DJ that was 
uh, simulcast on Radio 1 and Radio 2, which yeah. they wouldn't do that now, would they? I mean, it was, you know... Well, you that, was an, it. that was an economy move. Yeah. Uh, the BBC... Uh, Great for you, though. I was on Radio 1, yeah. and they chopped the programme on, on yeah. Radio 2. So that gave us an enormous audience. I mean, yeah. nobody knows quite what the audiences were, but depending on which newspaper you read, it yeah. could have been 18, 19, could have been 20 million people. Yeah. Audiences that would only be dreamt of now because yeah. there were so many different radio stations. I mean, I called the book The Golden Days of Radio 1, and it was the golden days because certainly in the first six years, there were no other radio stations. It was the only music station. Yeah. And also at that particular time, we're talking about 60s and early 70s, music ap appealed across the board from grandparents to grandchildren. Yeah. You know, the same families who watched Top of the Pops, which was hosted by Radio 1 DJs, were the people who listened to uh, Radio 1. And they liked, they all liked David Cassidy, yeah. and they all liked Donny Osmond. So uh, that doesn't happen now, you yeah. know. I mean, can you imagine now grandparents liking the same music as their grandchildren? You're uh, spot on, actually, because it's true, you know. It's like the Bay City Rollers were very ineffectual really they didn't offend anybody it was just nice music just good pop music well they upset you know? johnny walker yeah <laughs> he, did, he, did, he didn't want to play them and he he left the bbc and went to work in america because he didn't want to play the bay city rollers i played them i actually toured with them you yeah. know it wasn't the music that i was wildest about but they were massive yeah I mean, roller so, mania yeah and so you're this huge dj on radio one they're the biggest band in the world it's like one direction today isn't it and you're out there with them i mean was that that must have been very exciting though to be with them and touring around well there was the classic broadcast uh from mallory park i remember the race yeah. racetrack and uh, i was i was comparing it with annie nightingale the bay city rollers were guests there and it was the height of roller mania yeah. And uh, they, they actually got onto a boat on a lake to get away from their female fans who all jumped in fully clothed and, and swam out after them. So, I mean, it, it made quite a story at the time. I mean, all these girls were absolutely drenched, obviously. And it's worrying, actually, because, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, do you? I mean, the fans can be quite nutty. Somebody you know? could have drowned. Yeah, easily. It could have been very disastrous. And when I, when I uh, compared the David Cassidy tour, there was, if you remember, a stage collapsed yeah. and somebody was killed. And David Cassidy, you know, he died just recently. Yeah. He was a very interesting character. I got, a, got to know him very well comparing his tour. Yeah. One of the things that he hated was the girls screaming because he was a good singer yeah. and he wanted them to hear him sing. <laughs> So what he did was he put cotton wool in his ears so he couldn't hear the girl screaming and then, unfortunately, he couldn't hear the band. <laughs> You've got to laugh, though, haven't you? Because, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I met him very briefly, David Cassidy. He was a little bit, um, um, shall we say, different in the period that I met him. But, I mean, you're talking about when people were, because this is pre-internet, and the, their power as stars was driven through fan bases. Well, he's a very good-looking boy, David yeah. Cassidy, and uh, young women were wild about him. I mean, he, when he came over here and toured, during the day, he would like to have gone horse riding, but he couldn't. So he spent his entire time holed up in his hotel room, and the girls used to shin up the drain pipes and try to get into his room, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of people would think that was great, but it, he, he, he wasn't happy with it. Yeah. And when it's sad, you know, he looked look back on his life do you know the last words that he said? You know, terribly sad. He said, so much wasted time. Wow. Yeah, but he gave a lot of joy to people as well. Yes, he you did. You know, you have, you have to look at the positive. He was, to me, you know, so it's like, I'm not just saying this, but reading your book, it evoked so many memories. I wanted to ask you about um, the jingles on Radio 1 were so iconic. Yes. And you don't realise that now. When you listen to Radio Now, they're quite bland, you know. Yeah. But the 275285 National Radio 1. Wonderful Radio wow, 1. Wow, yeah, you know. Yeah. And very clear and very beautifully sound, very, you know, tight harmonies, that sort of stuff. And you, again, you know, you, you to anybody of our generation, you play that and you can go straight back to your little transistor yeah. listening to you coming out. But you have to remember as well, Neil, that until that particular time, you hadn't had jingles on the yeah. BBC and the light programme, you had had scripted programmes, yeah. you know, it was, it was very formal and it was scripted and it was only the pirates coming along that brought in the jingles yeah. and when they launched Radio 1, they said, what we've got to, two things we've got to do, we've got to sign up lots of pirate radio DJs to placate the public who've you know, lost all their pirate radio stations and you've got to have lots of jingles to make it sound like the pirates yeah. and that's why, why they did it. But they were... 
They were great. I think they were made in America. Uh, yeah, the just early brilliant stuff, Yeah, wonderful. You know? And I think that was as much part of the brand that you had, you know, because everybody, you've got a very distinctive voice. I mean, to me, you know, I know you straight away whenever I hear you on the radio. Uh, but looking back at that period for you, you are now, all of those Radio 1 DJs, um, particularly the daytime ones, are superstars. I mean, you're bigger than some of the pop records you're playing, you know, because when you went to do stuff, like yeah. you still talk about opening stores and, yeah. um, you know, doing nightclub appearances. It's you that's driving the audience in. That must have been confusing for the BBC. You not. wouldn't you wouldn't get that now because yeah. there's so much radio. And of course, there are superstar DJs. Yeah. I mean, there are people like Chris Evans and, and Steve yeah. Wright. And He's probably the last one, though. Yeah, you probably the I mean? last uh, ones. Yeah. Uh, on the cover of the book, there are 11. They were all the household names. Yeah. There was Emperor Roscoe, for example, who was the first American DJ. Yeah. And I'll do my Roscoe impression, if you like. Would you yeah, like yeah, that? I remember okay. it, yeah. My, my, my. Have mercy, baby, I'm gonna blow your mind. Yeah, 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 I remember. Excuse me, murders, <laughs> murders your throat. Yeah. And you know, the first time he did it, the newsreader came on and said in a very formal voice, yeah, I'm gonna blow your mind, baby. And the newsreader said, and now the news in English. <laughs> That wonderful, That's and then brilliant. there was Fla Freeman, of course, yeah. who was the first Australian. Yeah, greetings, pop pickers, not off. But he was great, though, wasn't he? He's another one. He was just. I think this is the thing. You all had your own individual personalities, and it's like anything. You tune into the ones that you liked. You know, I remember going on the bus to school, and Tony Blackburn was the breakfast show host. But you just, he, I remember him saying, "This is live across the nation from a broadcasting house in London." And I remember sitting on this bus in Jewsbury thinking. I wonder where that is. You know, like you were saying, it's like, yeah. where's Broadcasting House, you know? Yeah. And, wow. Well, you know, talking about Fluff Freeman, he had a, a feature on his program in the afternoon called Get It Off Your Chest, <laughs> which was a way that people could write in, because in those yeah. days we wrote in, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. Postcards and all and of that. And you just thought it was actually going to be read, didn't you? You yeah, just well, believed it. It, it did, yeah. it was, maybe a yeah. week later. You, <laughs> yeah. had to have a week, you know, had to go through all the system yeah. and then finally get read out. But people, with this Get It Off Your Chest, people could write in and talk about things that really annoyed them. But some people took it the wrong way and lots of women sent him their bras. So they were hanging all over. The first time I saw him in the studio, I walked in there and all these bras were hanging up all over the studio. Now that wouldn't happen today either, would it? No. No, no. Well, you, well somebody would take a picture and then that would be turned into a crisis. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, sackable of, yeah. sackable offence probably yeah. today. Well, I think what's interesting is, um, you know, as you said, there's so many great people that were on the channel at the time. And the, the fun thing that comes from me is it was entertaining you were all fun you all had your own personalities yeah i used to love the sort of um, uh, backstabbing things you did as you crossed over everybody did it, yes. but it was great you know yes. because you weren't quite well, sure blackburn, if you got blackburn and i were the first people to have yeah. two uh, sorry d daily three hour radio shows he had three hours in the morning i had three hours in the afternoon and we decided to be rude about each other so you know we would do uh, uh the, the, like there's nothing he wouldn't do for me and nothing i wouldn't do for him and that's how we go through life doing nothing for each other you know? <laughs> and then he did an entire edition of top of the pops wearing a t-shirt saying i hate david hamilton you know which of course was wonderful publicity yeah and people speculated did they really hate each other or, or did they get on well actually we were we were good friends i was his best man when, when he got married for the second yeah. time and uh, you know we were we were good pals so it was like but people wanted to think yeah that, you know that we but hate it, it's kind of good for you i mean you mentioned top of the pops again uh, you know that must have been thrilling david to be a host on there because yeah. it's the number one show and yeah. we all sat on a thursday night watching it and you never really knew who was the host because he didn't sometimes no. say in the radio times or whatever so you'd turn up and you'd think, oh it's those two or whatever uh, and the ones that the, the, i remember you you always had a, an exuberance you always seemed like you wanted to be there yeah, whereas john peel looked like he wanted, he was, oh, you know, and you kind of think, well, why don't they just get somebody that likes these then? You know, so what well, that was, was it his, like introducing that was that? his style, wasn't it? And yeah. in a way, that's what made him different. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I was very excited to be there and something that, you know, I mean, again, having watched it for so many years yeah. to be at the you know, first show, really nervous. Yeah. But the thing that struck me about it the first time I walked into the studio was how small the set was. Of course, with clever direction, it looked a lot bigger. Yeah. But it was very small. There were probably about 100 teenagers who were just 
went from one set to another. You know, and as David Essex finished his number over here, they'd be a floor manager would herd them over to yeah. this way, and then Rod Stewart would be there doing his his song. You know, and the other thing about it was, you know, nowadays you hear about people earning a lot of money with the BBC. I, for doing Top of the Pops, I never earned a hundred pounds. I think the most I ever got was about ninety quid. And I remember we used to record it on a Wednesday night. And afterwards, I used to do a disco in a pub in the old Kent Road called the Dun Cow, which is now a dentist uh, <laughs> surgery, funnily enough. And I probably got about three times as much for working to 200 people in a pub in the old Kent Road as I got in for doing a national television program watched by 15 million. Wow. But of course, the TV show gave you the shop window it's for the, the exposure, gigs. isn't it? You know, yeah. who were the acts that you remember that you liked on the show? Because I mean, you'd, I always thought it was um, it must have been so exciting for you as the the host to be close to some of these, yes. you know, which I now I call yes. like Rod, as you say, yeah. and people like that. Do you and know you the, get to see you them know the free, pop star you know? I was most excited to meet? I think you'd be quite surprised. Go on, Roy Orbison. Oh, I loved Roy Orbison. Yeah, and I tell you why. One of the first records I bought was only The Lonely by yeah. Roy Orbison. And I used to play it on my father's radiogram. <laughs> there were radiograms. And my father said to me, why are you playing the same record over and over again? And I said, because it's fantastic. That's what we yeah. did then. We got a record, we loved it. Wore it out. And yeah, wore it out. You play it over and over, on an old 78. Yeah. And so now suddenly, like we're, we're sitting in the studio and sitting opposite me is the big O. And he's got the shades on, you know, I thought this man has been a star all my lifetime, yeah. and finally, I'm actually I've actually got to meet the Big O. He was a lovely. I, I did one of the last television interviews with him, and he died not long afterwards. And when he died, a clip of our interview was actually shown on the news at ten. Mm. And I, for me, you know, I, I had interviewed you know yeah. El, Elton John, Rod, Rod, Rod Stewart. I mean, loads of the greats, and were, uh, compared the Beatles compared yeah. the Rolling Stones in concert. I've got a good story for you about the Rolling Stones. 1963 or 1964, 1964, I'm comparing the Rolling Stones in concert at the Palace Theatre in Manchester. And when I say comparing, they had support, lots of support acts in those days, topped by the yeah, Rolling Stones. Yeah. So I had a little red MGB sports car that I was rather proud of, and I parked it at the back of the theatre, as you could in those days. Somebody thinking it was Mick Jagger's car scratched a message to him on the bonnet. So for a week, I was driving my car around with, I love you, Mick, on the bonnet. <laughs> But just, the, you know what you're saying there, David, just the fact that the Rolling Stones are at the Palace Theatre is, is yeah. a weird thing to think, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. they're, they're like arena stadium global stars now, well, you know. But... early days of their career, yeah. somebody got a lucky booking, hadn't they? Yeah. They got them, before, you know, and I, they'd had a, a few rec hit records b before then. When I compared the Beatles, uh, that was the same thing. Brian Poole and the Tremolos, a couple of other support acts as well. That was again in Manchester. And I remember my fee was 10 guineas. That was 10 pounds and 10 shillings. And you know, the funny thing is I'm still on the same money now. <laughs> well, aren't where we did, all? Where did I go wrong? <laughs> but you know, you, it must have been so thrilling though when you think, because these are, uh, even then there were massive bands. Did you, because you know, you worked in music all your life. Did you see that, that the, the long thing in these people? Did you think, I could see these people having a long career, or did you see them as I don't think anybody. Pop stars, I don't think know? anybody could know that it would last as long as it has done. Yeah. Uh, the Beatles, of course, split up at the end of the 60s. Stones with, you know, one or two yeah. changes of personnel still going. Um, I could see that they were going to be very big for a long time. Yeah. You know, the, Be the Beatlemania was certainly here. And then at that time in the in the 60s, people either loved the Beatles or the Stones, yeah, didn't they? Yeah. You were one or the other. If you were a bit more establishment, you probably liked the Beatles. And then if you were a bit more of a rebel, you probably liked the Stones. Yeah. You know, they were naughty boys, weren't they? But when you went on the stage and there's all these screaming Beatles fans, could you be heard? Because, I mean, they must have just been screaming, we want, we want John, you know, we want Ringo. Well, well, and you're uh, like, hello? Yeah, <laughs> actually, you're absolutely right. And uh, with the Rolling Stones, when that was a bill and there were other support acts as well, I can remember going on and introducing Julie Grant, I think, who was a girl singer at the time. 
And as I was introducing her, they were all chanting, we want the stones, we want the stones. How awful for an act to come on when all they wanted was the Rolling Stones. And there was one uh, compere of shows like that who actually found the answer to it. He told me about it and he said, what I did was I stood on my head. So I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I he stood on my head and I said to them, until you shut up, I'm not coming down. Oh. <laughs> he said, I was there for about two minutes. He said, but eventually they shut up and then I stood up and said, and now here are the Rolling Stones, whoever it was. So if I had learned to stand on my yeah. head, it might have been really useful. Oh, that's risky though today, isn't it? Can you imagine? They start throwing things at you, you know, they wouldn't bother now. Yeah, no, they? no, It'd no. be a lot different, you know. Yeah, but it, so it worked for him. I've got to bring in, because as ever, we never get enough time on these things, but I've got to bring in, you did um, a successful pantomime uh, at one of my favourite venues, the Bratford Alhambra. Oh, lovely. Uh, tell me the Ken Dodd story. Right. My, after working with Ken Dodd on Doddy's Music Box and getting the nickname yeah. Diddy David. I always wondered where that came from. Yeah. Now I get it, the Diddy men. Doddy, yeah, yeah. well, I was, his, I was his straight man or his interviewer, if you like. Yeah. And uh, during rehearsals, he called me Diddy David. <laughs> and he took me to, to one side afterwards and he said to me, I'm fairness to him, he said, do you mind me calling you that? He said, because if you mind, I won't do it anymore. He said, but if you don't mind, I think it'll stick. Yeah. And I said, I don't mind, and I've been stuck with it now for 50 years, yeah. so there you are. Anyway, after Dottie's Music Box, I got my first pantomime. You're absolutely right, Bradford Alhambra. I was playing Buttons in Cinderella. And Ken Dodd turns up one day at, uh, after the matinee and comes backstage and says, come on, I'm taking you out for dinner. So Ken was known to be, what, what should we say? Cautious. Cautious. <laughs> that's a good word. Cautious. Yeah. So I thought, well, that's very nice. Yeah. Anyway, we go across the road to Gold Sachs Fish and Chip Parlour. <laughs> we go into, it's, it's unlicensed, we go into the back parlour. He takes off his overcoat, takes two bottles of lager out of his overcoat pocket, puts them down on the counter and says, cotton chips twice, love. So we sit there. We have cotton chips, we have a swig of lager, and he gives me money, advice, not money, yeah. he gives me money. I said money again. Yeah, right? I've got money on the mind with Ken Dodd. It's <laughs> because he hadn't paid you. Ken Dodd. <laughs> he gives me advice that money can't buy. Yeah, yeah. And he, Ken was a wonderful buttons, yeah. and he said to me, he said, you've got the bubbly bit, you've got to work on the pathos. He said, you've got to remember, Cinderella is a cow. He said she's only running off with the prince because he's loaded, he's got loads of money. Yeah. She really loves you, you're the little page boy and she really loves you and you want to work on the pathos. And he gave me advice on how to do that. So the next day, I thought to myself, I thought, well, Ken and I could have gone to the best hotel in Bradford. We could have gone to Yates's wine bar, couldn't yeah, we? Yeah. And we could have had a slap up meal. We could have talked about football on holidays, instead of which we went to the fish and chip shop, we had cotton chips, we had lager, and he's given me this priceless advice, so I've got to work on it. So anyway, a couple of nights later, I'm doing the kitchen scene where I sing Smile to Cinderella. Smile, though your heart is aching. Charlie Chaplin song. And normally, after I sang it to her, that's when she ran off with the prince. You know? <laughs> on this particular night, I'm walking off to the wings, and a little boy in the front row shouts out, Cinders, marry Buttons. So I got on the phone to Ken. He said, well done, son. He said, you're on your way. Wow. And that is lovely, isn't it? Because, yeah. and that proves why he's successful because he studied it. You know, I think a lot of people go into Panto and they get the script and they just, they just do it. But it is um, a, a very uh, skilled genre, I think, to get kids on your side. You know, you well, it is, and he was brilliant at it. And I'll tell you, tell you a couple of other stories uh, about Ken. As you know, this year he got his knighthood. Yeah. And um, I've been doing a, t a tour, theatre tour, David Hamilton's Rock and Roll Back the Years. One of the, I, sometimes I do a little gag or two about Ken, working with him. Anyway, I came off stage and the stage manager said to me, he said, we had Ken here in our theatre recently. I said, yeah. He said, what time do you think the audience went home? I said, tell me. He said, half past two in the morning. Now he's just had, you know, November, his 90th birthday. So I rang him up and I said, Congratulations, Ken. He said, well, he said, I'm going into politics now. I said, really, as what? He said, Chancellor of the Exchequer. <laughs> he, you have to laugh at Ken, though, because he did turn that whole episode into just, as only he can, 
cracking humour. You he know, says, so he says in his act, he says, I'm not worried about the tax man. He said, I'm fully paid up to 1973. Yeah, I mean, and it's true. He said, you know? I can remember the days when income tax was two pence in the pound. Yeah. I thought it still was. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, that, you know, that's an art lesson as well as when, when you, you know, we all have problems in, in your, your career. And he, I wondered how he would get out of that. Because you wonder, as a comedian, you know, you think, how is that going to bounce out? Well, he had a wonderful, he had a wonderful QC, George yeah. Carmen. And yeah. George Carmen famously said, um, a lot of accountants are comedians, but no comedians are accountants, which yeah. was a terrific line. And true, and, actually. And, and true. Yeah. But I learned a lot of things working with Ken. Um, he said to me, uh, we did two series of Doddy's Music Box, went out on ITV on Saturday nights, one in 67, one in 68. And he often used these words, he said, listen and learn. And one of the things that I learned from him is that he always had time for people. Yeah. And people would come backstage, they'd go to his dressing room, he could be there till one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. He would be there signing autographs yeah. and talking to people until the last one had gone and then finally he would go home. Yeah. And you know, it's those lessons that you learn. And I think I started in the business when you know, there was a lot to be learned from old pros. Yeah, yeah, it's talent though, isn't it? You know, you, you talk about it, but I mean, I think nowadays everybody wants to be a radio DJ. Um, and a lot of people from your era are called radio personalities. But to me, a personality is somebody that entertains you while playing the music that you like. Yes. And the links have to be, you know, encouraging, uh, thoughtful, you know, Hopefully. that sort of thing. I, yeah. I think it's very strange because you in your book said you, you, you're surprised that nobody's ever put a radio station together with people that were so well loved that would still draw an audience. And it's well, funny, isn't it? They now, don't. if you did uh, and you had a gold station playing, yeah. you know, gold oldies like they have in New York, they yeah. have a station like that with, you know, a whole bunch of yeah, senior yeah. DJs. It was tried at Capital Gold, but it, it, the problem was it had an AM signal. Yeah. And nowadays, you know, you've got to have FM or DAB or, you know, I mean, a lot, lot of people now listen on the internet, but that's still, that will be more for the future, you know. Um, but if you had them together, unfortunately, a lot of radio, well, Radio 2 now, want to have uh, television personalities on radio rather than real radio people. And I think that's a shame. And there are two. I think there are two different types of characters. There are people that just are great on radio, yeah. that should remain on radio and not on TV. You know, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of another really, uh, Steve Wright. I thought he was a genius, comedy mind, everything. But it was all in the vision of your head. Yes. When he started to do it on TV, it didn't quite work. No. I was thinking, you know, you look, you don't look how I imagined you're going to look. You I know? think he would know that now, yeah. and I think he would stick to what it's good at. Yeah. Yeah, it's good at. I mean, you mentioned earlier that I had diversified, and you know, I have. I mean, working with people like Ken Dodd, also Tommy Cooper. Yeah. You know, uh, Benny. What was he like? Benny, Hill. Benny Hill and Tommy Cooper. I mean, they were great people. I mean, wow. Wonderful. I mean, again, so much to be learnt from yeah. from working with them. Uh, and all the gags about Tommy Cooper, there's a lovely, lovely story about him. And, uh, you know, once again, a lot of the old pros were very tight. Yeah. You know, very careful with money. But I think that's fear, don't you, though, David? I do. Like, like they're, they're working now, but they, they might not be working in two weeks. Do you so, know what you know? I think? I think uh, that's absolutely right. And what I believe is I think comedians have this fear that they're going to wake up in the morning and not be funny anymore. Yeah. And what an awful, you know, how awful when, you know, you're a very difficult thing to do, isn't it, to make yeah. people laugh. There are days when you might, you and I might feel funny, yeah. and days where, that we feel about as funny as a bowl of rice pudding. You yeah, know, but it's but, true, and, and, but they've got to go on and do it. They have to you be, know, yeah. in a way that, you know, a plumber has to, has to fix drains or pipes, yeah. you know, they've got, they have got to be, by order, funny. That's yeah. otherwise they've let people down. And um, so a lot of them were very tight, and, and Tommy was said to be very yeah. tight. And of course, one of his things he would say with uh, taxi drivers, he'd get out of the cab and he'd say, have a drink on me, and give them a tea bag. But he's great. <laughs> I wouldn't dare do that though, would you do? I just no. wouldn't dare do it. You know, but they're like, going to oh, go home and say to the wife, aren't yeah. they? You know, I got a tip from uh, Tommy Cooper well, today. Yeah, give me a tea bag. he's a megastar, isn't it? That's yeah. the thing. I mean, I, I, you mentioned Benny Hill. I met him very briefly. Uh, I once went to his flat in um, Queensway or Kingsway or whatever it was. And he struck me as a very lonely person. Yes, you know, he had, I um, think so. He was just watching TV. He had lots of TVs yeah. there. And uh, he was very keen to sort of tell me that he was up on the right comedy. and you know. But I think he was, to me, um, one of the greatest... He was, uh, I think, uh, our answer to 
Charlie Chaplin. I thought he was genius. You know, because when he didn't speak, those silent films he made, genius. You I know, know. Uh, it's a shame the, he got lost in the sex. No, well, thing, the shame. You know? The shame was that we got into all the political correctness yeah. thing, and suddenly his programs were deemed not to be that. Yeah. Uh, of course, they were enormously successful in America Mega. and yeah. and all around the world. And I still get royalty, little royalties, not much, but little royalties coming through from the sketches. I remember one sketch very well that I did with him, and he gave me this funny line. And I introduced him, and he was actually a male, the first contestant in a male beauty contest. <laughs> like you imagine that it came on in little shorts and everything. So I introduced him, and I said, "Now here's our first." I was wearing the dicky bow, you know, yeah. the compare. And I said, "Now here's our first contestant, uh, Ivor Biggin from Mill Hill." And he looked at me, and he said, "No," he said, "I'm Ivor Mill from Biggin Hill." Oh, what a great line. <laughs> it's a good line, though. And yeah. that's what makes it clever. But he gave me the funny line about the Ivor yeah. you know. And I think a good comedian is not frightened to give away a good line. It's like Victoria Wood. She wrote brilliantly for, for the cast of people that she had, I think. Yeah. And gave away the better laughs to, to the Julie Walters and the, well, you know, the people with her. That yeah. is, that's generous. And yeah. Ken was like that, you know, Ken as well. Because in Doddy's Music Box, he had a repertory of, of actors, people like Graham Stark and Rita yeah. Webb and John Laurie. And very often he gave them funny lines. Yeah. And Rita Webb sent to him one, one week, he said, she said that, uh, you know, during rehearsal, she said, here, Ken, you know, she's real out now. Broad Cockney. She said, here, Ken, she said, I've got no funny lines in this sketch. She said, all I am is a little fat woman. She said, give me some funny lines. So he said, well, Rita, you're funny anyway. You're funny to look at. You're funny anyway. Yeah, but I need some more fun. So he gave us some more funny lines, you know. Which is, as you say, generous, yeah. isn't it? You know? Well, he was, Eddie Braben was writing with him. He was, yeah. was brilliant script writer then went on to write for Morecambe and Wise. See, you've know. been so lucky to be in with this, what I call the, you know, your book's called The Golden Age of Radio, but you've been in the golden period, in my opinion, of entertainment. You know, I mean, just as you say, working with like Eddie Braben, uh, you know, Benny Hill, these are people that we, you know, are still so famous today and so popular. Yeah. You know, maybe not, I think, terribly overlooked in here. When you see those documentaries, you know, um, uh, of these, uh, you know, when they do these um, like drama plays of people, they're doing one I think on Morecambe and Wise at, at Eddie Braden at mm. Christmas. You, because you've worked with them, I'm often intrigued as whether you think, well, that's not, well, that, it wasn't really like that. You know, it's a bit I mean? like a statue, isn't it? It yeah. never qu quite looks like the real thing. I'm, I'm amazed that the writers, the script writers, don't come to people like you've actually worked with them and say, what was he like? you know, off camera. Do you know, I get really fed up about that. I see programs about people that I've worked with and they're, you know, people are going on there, never met them. Yeah. I've just seen them on telly. Yeah. I'll tell you somebody else that I admired greatly and I like to think was a good friend was Bob Monkhouse. I love Bob. Yeah. Uh, he was so clever. Yeah. And a lot of people thought he was smarmy on television yeah. because he worked in a very slick American way. Yeah. But you had to see him live. And I saw him live a few times and I went to see him once at, at Bailey's at Watford. A huge was, venue in the time, though. Huge yeah. venue. Yeah. And the stage was up here, and the audience were sitting at tables down there. And I had a drink with him and Jackie, his wife, as he liked to have a glass of whiskey before the show, before he went on. And he said to me, the most terrible thing happened last night. I said, what was it, Bob? He said, well, I had a heckler in. He said, and you know me. He said, I can handle hecklers. I said, nobody better. You've got all the put-down lines in the world. He said, but I don't know what happened. He said, but something snapped. And he said, I went over to the table and I kicked him in the teeth. He said, and I came back to the dressing room afterwards. I said, God, he's going to be waiting for me after the show. He's going to beat me up or something. He said, but luckily he didn't. I think he'd had a few drinks and the family said, look, you know, let's go Get home. Up. But I thought, you know, again, Leo, you know, it's very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Because you think even the greats, there's a point at which they yeah. snap. There's a point at which they think, you know, I can't, I can't hack this. Yeah, I mean, I love, Bob Mungas, I was lucky enough to meet him a couple of times and, and near the end, and he came into a radio station, of all places, and the terrible thing happened, you know, we were chatting before doing the interview, and I don't know what happened, but this girl came along with some coffees on a tray, and she realises it's Bob Monkhouse and goes, and the tray capsizes, I know, into all of his fabulous, because he was beautifully dressed, yes. fabulous suit, everything, My you God. know. And you know, when you both sit there and go, yeah. And then look at her. What then did look he down. say? I just said, I'm, I'm Barbara. Oh, you know, and the girl's just, you know, 
saunters off and we had to do the interview which was filmed uh, and he had a heart FM t-shirt on him and Bob was beautifully what turned did, What out, did he say know? to him? Nothing? Nothing. He was, he said, oh, look, it's fine. He was a it's gentleman. Fine. Just so nice. And, and all I said, oh, Bob, you know, we, we must pay for this cleaning, you know. And he said, well, and he, because he always had these like safari type things on, you know, it was very light. Oh, yes. And, uh, and it was stained, you know, I could see that it was, I thought, this ain't coming out, you know. And he never said anything or whatever. And every time we saw each other again, he said, you haven't got any coffee, have you? You know what I mean? <laughs> and I thought he was such a lovely man. So again, you know, when you tell me that. I did I, celebrity I think, squares with him a few yeah, times. Yeah, it was a great you know, show. That, that was, was great, great yeah. to do. Uh, and Blankety Blank, I did yeah. with work, and that was always good fun to do. Yeah. But no, I, I've been very lucky, really, to work with the with these great pros. Yeah. And I struggle now, I've got to be honest, I watch some of the comedy, uh, you know, stand-up comics yeah. now, and um, most of them I don't find as funny as what I deem to be the all-time greats, you know. Well, I find, you know, when you look at, say, some of the greats, you just mentioned, you know, the, the Tommies and all those sort of people, um, they went out with just a microphone and themselves. Yeah. There's, there's, I saw a guy recently on TV, a, allegedly a comedian, who had, uh, all he talks about is stats from Google. He's got a computer screen. And, yeah. You know, it's like a geography teacher. I thought, I'd love to put you in a venue with people that want to be made laugh without all of that paraphernalia and say, make me laugh because I don't think they can do it. I know. I, the other thing yeah. I don't like, I don't like all the expletives. Yeah. And you're, you know, you're, you're hearing the F word on te on television, you know, yeah. peak time on maybe on Saturday night. Yeah. None of the great comics needed to do that. They didn't need it. Funny's you funny, know. isn't it? You know, yeah. I think it, funny is funny. If you're Bob, funny, Bob you know. Monkhouse, for example, could be very smutty. Yeah. But he was, but it was, it was funny, yeah. you know, but he didn't just use an expletive. For, for but it's where your mind went when he said things. It's what you were thinking, because yeah. he'd look at you as if, like, you know, and then you were thinking, oh, you know. Max so, Miller. Yeah. Max Miller, who was, you know, uh, the, the, the cheeky chappy, yeah. but the jokes from the Blue Book, you know, all right. He was, I saw him, I was very lucky to see him live. Uh, I saw him right at the end of his career, one of his last shows, Finsbury Park Empire, I think it was. And he, he came on and he told a joke. And people thought, I mean, it would be nothing today. <laughs> I won't repeat it, but really it would yeah. be nothing today. But at that time, the audience thought it was so outrageous, you know. Here, he's, here's a funny thing, now this is a funny thing, you know. Yeah. And a lot of lot of comics, I think, based, I think, you know, Doddy must have been inspired by Max, yeah. Max Miller. Jimmy Tarbuck, definitely, you know. Yeah, and, and as you see, these people have still got, um, you know, like Jimmy Tarbuck, I saw him recently, he's still a very funny man. Yeah. You know, knows how to handle an audience, comes on very confident, you know. There was, I saw him um, on a, a TV show, The Palladium Thing, and he came on and did a bit of a tribute about Scylla. Uh, but the guy who was hosting it, and I can't remember, maybe it was Jack White, or something, he just took it off him so expertly, and then when he left, it flapped, and I thought, you could learn from that, you know what I mean? Watch where he's done. I think there's a lot to be learned from yeah. from the old pros. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, they should be given more recognition. And certainly if they're still alive, like Tarby, yeah. uh, we should see more of them. Definitely. We, now, listen, David, we're going to have to say, we should see more of you. It's been an absolute thrill to chat. I could chat to you all day. You, you've got so many stories. Your book's out now. Um, you know, tell me, uh, why should we buy your book, The Golden Age? Tell me why, if we're watching now, why should we buy it? Shall I hold it up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the golden, the golden days of, of Radio 1. Uh, there's a chapter about each of these people here on the cover, uh, the first 11, each one of them, all recognisable faces, all have some, some lovely pictures uh, inside. There them. are, actually. Lovely look, picture. Yeah. Can I show your, yeah, your yeah, viewers yeah, yeah, a yeah, lovely sure. picture here? One of my favourite pictures is this one with the three degrees. Oh, yeah. And I, I sort of discovered them. They were yeah. they were singing on Sunday night at the London Palladium. They sang a song called Year of Decision. Yeah. And I said to my producer, could I have that as the Hamilton Hotshot, my record of the week? And um, he said yes. And then the follow-up was When Will I See You Again, which of yeah. course was a multi-million seller. And, and played now, isn't it? Still on radio now. Will be play, played forever. Yeah. And when, it's, when it sold the million, um, the record company asked me, would I go to the Victoria Apollo where they were doing a concert and would I present them with a gold disc? And I said, of course I will. So I walked out on, on stage. Nobody knew I was going to be there. And I was ha holding in my hand the, the gold disc. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, when will I see you again? It has sold a million. The place erupted. I handed the gold disc to Sheila Ferguson. The band struck up and I stood in the wings with a lump in my throat. They never sang it better, and they sang, Well, when I see you again, fantastic.
David Hamilton, you've been fantastic. Thank you so much for being my guest today. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.